I think most of them are already gone, but we'll acknowledge that. Jesus loves the children of the world. Amen. Okay, go have a seat. Thank you very much. Today, uh, at 6 o'clock, we're going to be repeating uh, our performance of Star Queen that we've done here before. How many have seen a Star, a Star Queen performance before? Do you think it's worth bringing a friend to? Amen. I really think it's a great thing to bring a friend to, especially if this friend doesn't know a lot about the Bible. I've seen this, look, I've seen this happen before. I've had people bring a friend who didn't know much about the Bible, and they're always a little bit surprised because if they think they're coming to a Bible play, and they think it's going to be all serious. Uh, but this, and uh, you know what definition of comedy is, by the way, if you are into the theater. Uh, the theatrical definition of comedy is Shakespeare, all's well that ends well. That's what a comedy is. It's something that ends well. Lots of them, and this does is a story that does end well, and it's a good trip. And uh, they will, your, you and your friends, I hope, will laugh, will be disappointed if they don't laugh. And uh, so it's very enjoyable. And then as for them, so it's a good conversation starter, enjoyable. It is also, would you agree if you've seen it, this is good to bring children to, yes? yes. Yeah, it is. All right. My, I, I've seen children enjoy Star Queen from age four or five on up. So this will not be something where we'll dismiss them to go to the back room. All right. We want them here, right up front. Bring them right up front for it. If they act up, we'll... Send them back to you or something, all right? <laughs> but at any rate, I think they will be engaged in enjoyment. And uh, we'd love to have you here tonight at 6 for Star Queen. We, we've always and never gotten tired of this wonderful story. If you want to gear up for it this afternoon, get your Bible and read the book of Esther. Because it is the story of Queen Esther. All right? Good. Everybody take a deep breath. I want to uh, I want to uh, talk. I'm going to re-preach something that I preached here maybe about ten years ago, and I suspect there's some of you were here. I, I kind of hope you remember it, but if you don't remember it, it'll be a reminder. Uh, and uh, so either way, I hope it's a win-win because the longer I was here this weekend, the more I got convinced that this is what the Lord has had. All right. Now there there's a couple of passages in the Bible I'd like for you to look at. The, and no, pay attention because there will be a test. But it'll be an easy test because we'll reveal all the answers and everybody will pass this test with flying colors. But the first passage is found in Matthew chapter 9. And if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, I want to start reading at the first of the kingdoms and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now pay attention. Here comes the test passage, all right? Then he said, all right, now, when you read those verses and you see what Jesus said in that passage, there's something that there's a lot of and that there's something that there's not a lot of, right? Now, what is it that there is a lot of? The word harvest, people in harvest, but it, it is people, it's a people harvest, but we'll just make the, the stand workers, absolutely right. So there's, there's a lot of what, but not a lot of what. So what does Jesus say to do about that? Pray. Did you see that? It, ask is, a, is right out there, but, but we're talking about prayer, aren't we? it's pretty obvious, isn't it? So we're going to make the standard answer here, pray, all right? So what does Jesus say to do about this? Pray, all right, and I don't think there's any problem with that. Uh, that's just right what it says, okay? So now everybody knows the answers, right? So let me, let, this will be a review, and then we'll take the exam, all right? Now there's, what is it that there is a lot of? What is it that there's not a lot of? Well, what does the Lord want us to do about that? Pray. Pray for what? There's a lot of? What does he say there's a not, not a lot of? So what does he say to do about that? Pray. For what? Workers. That's right. Very, very good. Give yourself an A plus, smiley face, smiley face, star, whatever. Now listen, this is very simple, and I have a challenge to issue to you and me both out of this passage, and it's this. Look, there's still, to this day, this is as up to date 
as this morning's news. There are, more than ever, there are just all kinds, of, and the harvest is people. There are all kinds of people out there who need the Lord. There's a lot of harvest. There's a lot of what? Harvest. But there's not a lot of what? <laughs> Workers. So what does Jesus want you and me to do about that? Your hand, all right? And let me see if you still got it. Have thrown it away. Have gone skipping it out across the pond or something. All right. Okay. All right. Get your rock. Now, one thing I'd like for you to let this rock to remind you of is not just to pray, but pray for what? Workers. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Lord said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send you a preacher. Preacher. Is that it? No, the Lord does not say a singular word there, does he? It's a plural word, isn't it? And I think we know the difference between singular and plural, don't we? The thing is, is the Lord wants us to pray for plural workers. Everybody say workers. 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 Worker. We need to pray for workers. So by the authority of Jesus Christ, what do you do about that? Pray. Pray for what? I'm glad nobody said a preacher right then. All right, <laughs> workers. Now, a preacher is a worker, but a worker is not necessarily a preacher. All right, workers, workers. The Lord wants us. So will you, by the authority of the Lord Jesus, make this a part of your prayer life? This is challenge number one that I want to issue to you and me both. I would like for you, and I first met the, look, I first met the recruiting for the Bible college. I'm not asking all of you to go to, you know, mainland China or something, or I'm not asking you to sign up and go to Great Lakes or something and, and just quit whatever you're doing and, and get into the ministry and go be, no, no. I'm, he said, I'm not even asking you to go. He said, I'm asking you to pray. He said, will you go home and start praying for work? Every time I opened it, I would be reminded to pray for workers. And I started praying when I was 15 years old for workers in the harvest. Since that time, I have not quit praying for workers. I'm now 75. And I keep praying. I've got it in my prayer book. At home, things to pray for. I put the word workers in there every month. And I would like to encourage you to do the same thing. Praying for workers. Yes. Okay, if you will, that's you will meet challenge number one. Just start today. You know, you get done today, you go out for lunch, you say, Oh Lord, thank you for the day, thank you for church, thank you for lunch. And by the way, it's please send workers in the harvest. You go home this afternoon, you're getting ready to take an afternoon nap, and you say, Now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And uh, if I should die before I wake, Lord, please send workers in the harvest. One final exam. There's a lot of. There's not a lot of. So what does the Lord want us to pray for? What does the Lord want us to do about there being a lot of harvest? What does the Lord want us to do about there not being a lot of workers? What does the Lord want us to pray for? Workers. All right. So will you pray for workers? Yes. Now, if you will, God will answer that prayer. God will, let, he will start sending workers. People in the church say, look, I want to go into ministry. You, you might see that. You might see it around you with people that you know. You start praying for workers because that's what the Lord, look, I'm not making this up, am I? No. I'm not. I mean, it's there. It's in the Bible, isn't it? If you've got a red print Bible, it's in the red, red, red words. If, it's, if you don't, it's in black and white there. That's from the Bible. That's from the words of Jesus. This is something that he wants us to do. And so, challenge number one, pray for workers. Okay? You got that? I'm not here yet, but you will get here. And I hope this will be reviewable when you get there. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And uh, I'm going to start reading at verse 14. Now, in James chapter 2, right, and I'm, I'm betting, if I were a betting man, I'm betting you'll be able to answer these questions correctly without even a review. But let me ask the first question there in verse 14. What? good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith that has no deeds, what good is that? To have faith that has no deeds. No. That's the right answer. That's the definitive answer. So let me ask it again. What good is it if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? No. All right, next question. Can such faith, man claims to have faith that has no deeds? I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? None. Isn't it obvious to get none? I mean, you talk, 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 but you don't do anything about it. What good is it? 
No. So the answer to the first question is none. The answer to the second question is no. And the answer to the third question is none. Save me? Well, suppose a person has needs and you say go be taken care of, but you do it, don't do anything about it. What good's that? No. All right. Very good. All right. And so I'm going to go down to verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So the fill in the blank. What is faith by itself if it's not accompanied by action? It is none dead. Okay, give me the answers. None, no, none dead. What good is it if a man says he has faith but he has no deeds? Can such faith save him? No. Well, suppose a person has needs and you say be taken care of, but you don't do anything about it. What good's that? Oh, well, in the same way, if faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by deeds, is? Yes. All right. And he goes on and he says this. I'm going to skip the deeds in that verse. Useless. useless. Everybody say useless. useless. All right. What is faith without deeds? Useless. And there's another one syllable word that faith without deeds earlier is. It is dead. dead. So we got dead and we got useless. So it's none, no, none, dead, useless. So everybody say that. Just repeat after me. None, none no, no, dead. dead. I, I, wait, I, I, and I'm going to skip down to the end of the chapter and read verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead. What is a body without a spirit? Dead. All right. So faith without deeds is dead. dead. So a body without a spirit is dead. And faith without deeds is dead. dead. All right. So here are the answers to all these questions. Let me see if I can remember. Dead. Dead. All right, let's try it together. Okay, let's see if we can do this. Ready? None, no, none, dead, useless, dead, dead. Doesn't that sound exciting? <laughs> <laughs> do you know anybody like that? The audience, and you see some people, and every question you, you ask, it's like, none, no, none, dead, useless, Dead, dead. All right. So let me ask the questions. You know the answer. All right. What good is it if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? None. Can such faith save him? No. All right. Well, faith without deeds is also useless. useless. All right. I threw you a curve there. Useless on this. So faith by itself is useless. useless. First of all, it's dead, and then it's useless. All right. So the first word is dead. Second is useless. useless. All right. And then a body without a spirit is dead. faith without deeds is dead. All right, now suppose you reversed all these. What would be the opposite of none? Wow. What would be opposite of dead? Alive. What would be opposite of useless? Useless. useless. Dead? Alive. Dead? Alive. Alive. Okay, so I'm going to say the negative. You give me the opposite. Okay, ready? None. Alive. No. Yes. None. Alive. Dead. Alive. Alive. Useless. Useless. <laughs> Dead? Alive. Dead? Alive. Okay, let's see if we can say all the positives instead of the negatives, all right? Now, I'll say it, and you can give it back to me. I think I can get it. A lot. Let's put some excitement in the saying of these words, okay? All right, so because they're very positive, up words, aren't they? All right? Well, first of all, let's say the negative and just let your voice reflect the personality of these words, okay? Just say it. Like it, like it ought to sound. Ready? Here we go. The first, this is the negative list. Starts with none, okay? And do the best you can. Ready? No. No. Now let's say the opposite. Ready? Okay. A lot. Yes. A lot. Alive. Useful. Alive. Alive. <laughs> now what's the difference in the list? The list. What's the difference between none and a lot? No and yes. Dead and alive. Useless and useful. Dead and alive. Oh, here's the second challenge. Not only pray for workers, pray to be a worker. Because being a worker is the difference between none and a lot. It's the difference between no and yes. It's the difference between dead and alive, between useless and useful. Dead and alive, dead and alive, dead and alive. Hey, it's a worker. Can you get a little pumped about this? <laughs> I hope you could. I'm pumped about it. I'm pumped about it. Listen, uh, uh, you got to be careful. You know what you got to be careful about? And I'm trying to speak to the Fairland Christian Church right now when I say this, is you don't need one man to come and work himself to death. And I keep hearing people say, we've got to find a man. What is, you got to find a worker? 
Where did you get that in the Word of God? I'm listening. <laughs> what? You'll have a hard time making a case for that biblically. But what can you see how easy it is to make a case for workers? Plural. Look, you don't need, you don't have many people in the room this morning. 60, 70? God, make me a worker. Give me work to do for you, Lord. Give me work. Now look, come, you came here this morning. That wasn't much work. I mean, I'm glad you're here, but don't you know that wasn't a lot of work. I mean, some of you is probably act the Congress to get you out of bed on Sunday morning, but still, that wasn't like How much effort does it really, go look up the dictionary definition of work and ask yourself how much work for Jesus. It's not a whole lot of work, is it, really? Nobody's going to talk to him. You don't want me to say this. You, you don't like what I'm saying. But I'm saying you are not working a whole lot by showing up on Sunday morning. But I tell you what, not only are you not working a lot, you're being cheated. And I tell you what, you're being cheated. People I know, the most useful people I know, the most yes people I know are people at work <laughs> that have things that they do for Christ almost every day of the week. And look, you want to be a worker for the Lord, it'll make you come alive. The way sitting in a seat won't do. It will make you a yes person. It always says yes to. And I thought that was a neat title. And I checked it out. It's a good book. I recommend it. Because what this guy's done is gone through the Bible and he's got Bible background for prayers that there's a very high percentage. And if you pray this prayer, God's going to say yes because that's something God wants. And so if you pray that prayer, you're praying something that God wants and you've got confidence that if you're praying something God wants, then uh, he's going to answer that prayer. Well, one of the prayers he prayed, you'll get an answer within 24 hours. It'll come quicker than you can imagine. And uh, let me tell you what the prayer is because I agree. Now, be careful about praying this prayer. All right. Now, you're not praying it, but just repeat it after me. Dear Lord. Dear Lord. Give me something. Give me something. Or somebody. Or somebody. That I can do something for. That I can do something for. Or somebody that I can do something I can do for for you today. Before this day's over, God will give you something. Something will happen. I have seen this prayer answered over and over and over again. Go home, pray. Pray it every day. You're going to be amazed at what God will do. You know what? We, I'm, our family prays that prayer. And you know what the biggest problem in our family is right now? There's not enough. We have to turn stuff down. We got stuff to do on, I got stuff to do on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I got stuff to do every day of the week. And look, it's, it, it, it's, it's stuff to do. And when I say it's stuff to do, I don't mean that negatively. I mean, our life is full. Our life is very rich. I'm a happy man. Our family's a happy family. And we feel like, Everybody here kept praying, Lord, show me things I can do for you. Show me things, anything. And it'll be different for every person. It won't be the same for everybody. But it'll be astounding sometimes. Sometimes you just look for somebody else doing something. We did that. So we work with we work with homeless people. We work with drug addicts. We work with uh, unwed prostitutes on our refrigerator. She prays for some of them call her mama. And that just happened because she prayed. Now that may not happen to you. It may It was so funny. Somebody said something to my wife about that. She went to a dentist. And somebody was standing nearby and the word prostitutes was mentioned and this person standing nearby said, are there prostitutes in Knoxville? <laughs> <laughs> are there prostitutes in Niles? Yeah. I don't know where on earth you can go. But, but these, are, these are part of the harvest. These are part of, and it may be the field you get into. I don't know. It may be children. It may be grown-ups. It may be feeding hungry people. It burned. No. None. Dead. Useless. Dead. Dead. Be afraid of that. Be afraid that'll be the verdict on your life. But be pumped and thrilled about being a worker for the God. Pray for workers, okay? I heard what? Mm-hmm. Let me ask you, pray for workers, okay? Yes. And pray that God makes you a worker. Because if God makes you a worker, your life's going to take a turn for the better. Now, don't get me wrong. You, we prayed about this and talked about it earlier this week. You'll get tired. Don't worry about getting tired. But you've got to get tired doing something. 
I would hope you get tired of your rocking chair. I'd hope you get tired of that. What I would worry about. Don't worry about trying to ask the Lord to give you work to do. And if every person in this church became a little worker for the Lord, it'd be a sight to see what happened. It'd be a sight to see. Look, it will be more than any one person will be able to do. I don't care who. And the next month you might find super preacher. Once upon a time, there was a man who worked for a contractor. I don't know his name. I'll call him Clarence. If anybody hears Clarence, it wasn't you. I'm just making this up. Well, Clarence worked for years for this contractor, and he became kind of the head of the crews and the buyer of things and the supplier of things and the manager of things. But he had his every now and then. And uh, he, he, he kind of chafed a little at working for his boss. Well, one day his boss came to him and said, Clarence, said my wife and I are going, planning on going on a vacation for about six months. We're going to do a world tour. And he said, let me ask you, Clarence, do you, do you think that if I turn over all the books and all the credit cards and all the accounts to you, that you could run the business for me for, to build me a house? Clarence said, well, if I had all the resources, yeah, yeah, I could do it. And then the guy said, I want you to. He said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to find me the finest piece of land in this town. I don't care what it costs. We got plenty of money. You pay for it and you get started. And then I want you to build me a house. I want you to build me the best house that can be built on that fine piece of land and you can get done six months. Clarence said, well, if I got everything, I can do it. And so the boss, all the banks knew him and all that. And as his boss was flying away, Clarence was watching the plane go off into the sunrise. He turned around and started driving home and he thought, yeah, yeah, he's going on a six month vacation. I got to stay here and get all this work done. He was kind of griping and complaining and bawling his way back to town. He got a nice, real nice. And that wasn't necessarily the best piece of land, but it was a good looking piece of land. And he and that realtor juggled the books a little bit and they both made some extra money on the sale of that land. Clarence put it in the bank. So Clarence did the same thing with the materials. Now he knew how to buy materials and, and he could buy the top grade or he could buy maybe one notch down. And he did that with things. He buy maybe one notch down, but, but since he was knowledgeable, he juggled those books and he made several thousand bucks. But it looked good. The house really looked good. He did the same thing with landscapers. And when the pro he, he did get the project done in a little under six months, went and inspected it, and he just knew because he was a pro that even though he had made a lot of money and had not really built the high standards that uh, often boss said, well, uh, Clarence, uh, did you do what I asked? Yep, I did. You built me a house. Yeah, find this piece of land town. Find this piece of land town. Boss said, well, don't take me home. Take me by and show me our new home. So Clarence drove him across town. They drove up the hill to this nice piece of land, and, the, and they went through the whole house up and down, and it did really look good. It looked good. Now, Clarence knew things, though. The boss didn't know. But when they got done, they went in on the front porch, and the boss shut the door, locked it, and he stood there and he said, Clarence, this is a beautiful house, and this is a great piece of land, and, and you have done well here. So this house and this land all belongs to you. And the tragedy of the story is that deep in his heart, Clarence knew that all along he had been building his own house. But that's what you're doing. That's what we're all doing. We're building our own house. And in eternity, home is coming. Where he leads me, I will follow. I pray with 